If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Republican Jay Ashcroft is running for governor, which means the Secretary of State's office will be up for grabs in 2024. State Representative Adam Schwadron is one of four GOP officials seeking the post, and the St. Charles County Republican joins us on the latest episode of Politically Speaking to talk about his views on the big issues in that campaign and what he expects during the 2024 legislative session. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. My promise to St. Louis was that I would do the absolute most for each and every person, starting with those who have the very least. What I wanted to do was look and see what other states are doing. We have to be willing to change those laws, that they are balanced and they affect everybody equally. As somebody that grew up in the St. Louis area, in North St. Louis County, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. We gotta find long-term solutions to make government better, but also to be able to provide services to people. I don't wanna leave that federal money that we've been leaving all these years on the table. We need to be spending this money to take care of Missourians. I thought we accomplished a lot this year, but a lot more needs to be done. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent, Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me in studio, he is the representative for Missouri's 105th House District and also one of four Republican candidates running for Secretary of State. Adam Schwadron. So I'm just going to ask you right off the bat, why did you decide to forego your last two terms in the House and run for statewide office? Well, I've served on the Elections Committee uh, all the time that I've been in Jefferson City, and I actually ran for Director of Elections back in 2018 out in St. Charles County. Uh, Elections have always been one of my big things. I've always just been a nerd for it. Uh, The current chair, Peggy McGaw, she swears I sleep with a copy of the election laws underneath my pillow uh, because I'm always making sure that everything is uh, correct and uh, the way it should be. Do you? I do not sleep with the copy underneath my pillow. Because that would be pretty, that would make your sleep very, very uncomfortable, right? Yeah, my, my, my pillow, which is not a my pillow, but the pillow that I use, how about, for clarification there, uh, it is quite comfy, and yeah, I don't think a uh, copy of the statutes underneath there. Would, we'll we'll get to the my pillow stuff later, but continue. Uh, so I've always uh, had a love for elections, and for me, I see... There's a lot of distrust on both sides of the aisle of our elections process, and I I just want to make sure that we have free, fair, transparent, and trustworthy elections. And then there's also aspects of the office that aren't elections. Uh, everyone always focuses on Secretary of State as elections, but they do more than that. They do all the business and corporate registrations. They do libraries. They do the archives. And there's so much more that that office does, and I feel that I am going to be able to handle all aspects of that office. So you actually represent one of the most competitive state representative districts in the state. You, In your first re-election campaign, you won by 99 votes. So Correct. that was in 2022. Yes. Was that at all a factor in your decision to run for statewide office that you may not want to run in a competitive state legislative district again? No, that was not uh, part of the factor. Uh, I won my first election, 541 votes, and then redistricting happened, and they did give me uh, a much more purple district, as I like to say. But people always say that your first re-election is the most difficult re-election. The people know who I am. They return me. That's that time uh, in 2022, and I would be confident that if I were to run for re-election that the people would return me there as well. So you mentioned this, that the Secretary of State's office is more than just overseeing elections. It also is overseeing securities. It also has a lot to do with libraries, which we'll get to in a minute, and also business registration. Just generally, what would you want to do differently in the office compared to others who have served in the post? For me, I'm a small business owner. I started uh, the Clean Carpet Company back in 2010 with a friend of mine. And in 2013, I ended up buying out his half. Uh, So there are just a lot of uh, efficiencies or inefficiencies that I see 
uh, and I would love to add some more efficiencies, make it easier for people to start a business, having checklists, making sure that everything that they need is accessible from that office to ensure that their business isn't already hitting roadblocks with red tape. So that way, when they get going, they can just hit the ground running with whatever venture that they are pursuing. But it is a lot of election-related responsibilities. So hence the reason why a lot of my questions are going to be related to that. Oh, yeah, I get that 100%. So when we had uh, your St. Charles County colleague, uh, Senator Bill Eigel, on the show, he had talked about his view that election authorities should be hand-counting ballots as instead of using machines. Uh, what do you... What do you think about that idea, and would you advocate for that type of, of, of counting if you become Secretary of State? Uh, as far as hand counting, I would not advocate a return to hand counting. Uh, there's a reason that we have these machines to count them. It gives us a more accurate result as well. You can take a look at the studies that hand counting, uh, it may work in a small uh, one item or one issue election. But when you have an average of about 24 items on the ballot, you have to go through all 24 of those items. And you have more hands on all of those ballots more often. And to me, it's just a snake oil pitch. It sounds good, but in reality, it just does not work. Because I mentioned the my pillow illusion earlier. And let's just be, and I told this to Senator Eigel to his face. I think a lot of the hand counting stems from Mike Lindell and these conspiracy theories that vote counting machines somehow changed the outcome of the 2020 election. And there's no proof that any of this happened. And some, like with Dominion, for example, filed lawsuits against entities that made these claims. So, but it seems like this idea does have a lot of resonance in grassroots Republican politics. I guess from your prior answer, you you think it would be a bad idea to craft election policy based off what many believe are conspiracy theories. Is that a fair assumption? I would say just looking at hand counting, all the data uh, show that it is not a good idea. What I would be in favor of, like I said, I want to return uh, trust and transparency to the office. I want people to have faith that the results that they are seeing are the true and accurate result. So after the election, before the certification, let's have more robust audits. Uh, there was actually a uh, House election complaint filed in my election where the Democrat did not feel that the results were accurate. However, in the audit that they did, one of my precincts came up exactly even in that hand audit recount as was cast on Election Day. Now, one of the things that has happened in the last few years is Missouri has, it has implemented a government-issued photo identification requirement. Is there anything about the process that you would like to see changed if you're elected as Secretary of State? When I say the process, the process for either getting a, a free uh, government-issued photo ID or the process for how local election officials deal with someone who may not have one. Uh, no, I think the process works well right now. Uh, most people in our state will have that photo ID. And if you do need assistance, the Secretary of State's office is there to help assist anyone who is in need of a valid photo ID. And one point that was actually brought up during uh, a hearing that we had a veto session is that your ID, even though it's expired, is still usable up until the next federal election. One of the other major functions of the Secretary of State's office is developing ballot summary language for initiative petitions. Is there any way you would want to change that process, or do you think that the way Secretary of State Ashcroft is doing it now works? I think the way we do it now works under statute. We develop the fair ballot language, and there is the process that if someone feels that it is unfair, then it can be challenged. Uh, however, I take a look at it, and I like to follow the letter of the law and make sure that it is fair and balanced, and that's part of, again, keeping it free, fair, transparent, and trustworthy. Ashcroft has gained some controversy recently for the ballot summary language for a number of abortion-related initiatives, and opponents have contended he wrote the summaries in an intentionally prejudicial way because he wants them to fail. From what you've seen, do you agree with those critics, or do you think that they were done in a fair and even-handed way? I would say the way he did it, um, 
some people are alleging that he went too far in terms of the language. Uh, however, that does leave him susceptible to having the courts uh, draw it up. So uh, I can't speak to what the secretary, uh, what his thought process was. Um, I would say that a lot of that language that he used is actually pretty fair in my eyes. Now, he also has enco- he's encountered a decent amount of controversy throughout the seven years, which is why he's a fun person to cover, by the way. He also <laughs> received some criticism for the rules with state library funding, and it involved like the oversight of the material that is within the libraries. We, we've done prior shows on this. You can listen to Secretary of State Ashcroft talk about the details, but I'm sure you followed that entire situation. Would you have handled it differently, or do you think that Secretary of State Ashcroft's rules around libraries were were the right way to go? I think if you take a look at what the legislature just passed in Senate Bill 775 in 2022, uh, the sexually explicit materials uh, and governing their access to children, that passed the House 135 to 0, and it passed the Senate 31 to 1, and the one dissenting vote was Mike Moon. Uh, So... Uh, we don't need to have our children getting access to this material. And putting a simple rule in there that the libraries must ensure that the children are not getting it, now it, it's entirely up to the parents to determine if they want their child to look at that. That's fine. But having that hurdle in there is not banning books. Yeah, I think that the whole, but there have, oh, I'm taking aside the Ashcroft uh, rules because I agree with you that that was not about banning books. It was about whether they're in certain sections or not, which I think is a different question. But we are seeing some local libraries take books out that they deem to be inappropriate. And I think that the question becomes like, that's a very subjective observation. Some things that everybody feels is inappropriate may not be inappropriate for others. Is there is that something you would just sort of leave to local library boards to decide for themselves? Or would you use your perch as Secretary of State to develop some sort of uniform policy around what is a very difficult and subjective issue of appropriateness of books and libraries. I think I would actually encourage the legislature to clear up the language on that. Uh, Again, the Secretary of State's office does, uh, they house the Code of State Regulations. And so we do have these rules that are being written by people like the secretary and also unelected bureaucrats. One of the things that I do want to do is ensure that we are going through those rules and determine, should this be a rule or should this be under the purview of the legislature to create statute? One of the biggest election-related accomplishments of the last decade, in my opinion, is implementing an early in-person absentee voting period, which which started in 2022 and is still going strong in 2023. Um, first of all, how do you think that that has worked so far? Because for, pers- for personally, I had never voted absentee before, but when that was available, I went in and did it, and I thought it was a very smooth process. And from talking with St. Charles County uh, Elections Director Barr, a lot of people in St. Charles seem to like it too. What, what, what's been your impression about how that's worked so far? I think it's been great. This is legislation that I supported. I had it in one of my election bills that I filed. Uh, I think it was in my first year that I filed this legislation. But uh, having in-person absentee voting, no excuse, is great because we are still having people show up to the election authority or one of their satellite offices in the case of St. Louis County. And so they are still showing up in person, having to show their photo ID. And I think that is part of restoring the trust and faith in our elections. So there is still, though, an excuse-based absentee system in place if, for example, you send your absentee ballot through the mail. And and I've been very – I'm not usually super direct when it comes to issues, but I am going to be for this one. It's a useless law. No one has ever, in my – from my understanding, been caught by an election official for saying, I'm going to be out of town on this day, and they're actually not. And I kind of see it as, frankly, like a waste of people's time that they have to even, like, go through the mental gymnastics of deciding whether they're going to be truthful or or lie or not. Mm -hmm. And frankly, a lot of local election officials feel the same way. Do you think it's time to just admit reality that the excuse-based system in Missouri doesn't work and just let 
people use an absentee ballot for any reason it, it, outside the in-person absentee period. Uh, I think we would have to take a closer look at that. I'm still in favor of directing people to the polls. And I understand there are people that are not able to get to the polls. Uh, you've got military serving overseas. They definitely need the absentee ballot. You have people that are confined to their home that need an absentee ballot. I'm 100% aware and uh, recognize that we need it for that. But in that two-week period, if you can't get to the polls and you can't make it on election day, uh, and if it's just out of laziness or whatever excuse you have, uh, you should try to show up in person. We'll be right back after this quick break with State Representative Adam Schwadron. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. And we're back on Politically Speaking with State Representative Adam Schwadron. He is a Republican candidate for Secretary of State. So now we're going to talk about what Republicans call IP reform, mm -hmm. what I like to call just changes to the initiative petition process. What are your thoughts about making the Missouri Constitution more difficult to amend, either by raising the threshold to pass an amendment or by requiring passage in a number of congressional or state house districts? When we're dealing with the initiative petition process, we have to break it down into its separate parts. There's the asking of the question and there's the answering of the question. The asking of the question is the process of gathering the signatures and determining whether or not it should be on the ballot. I'm okay with the way that system is right now. 5% uh, statutory, 8% constitutional. And you don't support, like, saying you have to get 8% in all congressional districts. Correct. You're, you're fine with 6 out of 8 at this yeah, point. Yeah, I, I think that is uh, already a difficult thing to do, and the question is lies on the answering of the question, and that's the vote margin okay, by which it should be approved. I continue. So when it comes to uh, constitutional measures, I do believe that threshold needs to be raised from just 50 percent plus one. It should take more than a simple majority to amend things to our Constitution. Now, the other side of the thing that most people aren't talking about is the statutory initiative petition side. And I actually sponsored a bill this last session that would protect statutory measures voted on by the people from the legislature. Because if you take a look at the history, I think it mostly stemmed from the puppy mill bill, where they had the statutory change on uh, puppy mills. And then the legislature, the very next year, wiped all of that away. And so people said, why should we bother doing the 5% signatures when we're already out there? Let's do the 8 and let's amend it to the Constitution. I don't believe public policy belongs in our Constitution, and that is why I would love to prevent the legislature from making easier changes on what was just voted on by the people. Can you explain, like, if your initiative ended up passing, because it would need to be approved by voters, like, how many years would a statute be basically frozen before the legislature could change it? So I wouldn't freeze it 100 uh, percent because I've taken a look at bills that we've passed in the legislature that ended up needing a small change a year or two down the road. So what I am calling for is it would take three quarters of the legislature. So far beyond any supermajority that any party holds right now or possibly will hold. Uh, so it would take 75 percent of the House and 75 percent of the Senate to override any changes made by the people. Have you gotten any support for this idea? Because it seems like the vast majority of attention is around making it, ma raising the threshold for a constitutional amendment, but not really doing much with statutory initiative petitions. So the end result of what we voted on, the conference committee substitute, did have this measure in there, uh, just not at as high a threshold for changing from the legislature. Uh, I talked to the realtors, I talked to uh, liberal-leaning lobbyists, and they were very receptive because the other measure that I have in there, failing to reach that 75% threshold, 
anything from 50 to 75 would then go back to a vote of the people to determine whether or not these changes should be made. And we also made sure that this was protected for six years after passage. But from reading other parts of that uh, initiative that you're talking about, you it also contains language that says that a, a, a constitutional amendment would have to pass, I think, in a certain amount of congressional districts. Yeah, or, the concurrent majority. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, has not been universally popular for a lot of reasons. And I think that the biggest thing I've heard is there are questions about whether that would survive a court challenge because of the whole concept of one person, one vote. What's what's kind of your thought process about whether that idea could actually survive legal attacks. There was a lot of debate whether or not we should do it based on state house districts, state senate districts, or congressional districts. And I believe using the congressional districts would survive a court challenge because during the redistricting process, those are redistricted to exact populations. So they have to be equal to the person, whereas state house districts and state senate districts, they have that population fluctuation, uh, especially with the new rules that were just voted on by the people to where you're trying to keep as many districts in the same county. Do you think that any of these ideas, whether it be changing how the, the l- l- let me back up for a second. I, from what I have heard, there is definitely going to be interest in revisiting raising the threshold for a constitutional amendment this year in 2024 in the legislative session. I think there's an entirely different question if something gets put on the ballot, whether or not it includes your language or not, whether it finds any favor with Missouri voters, because not only is there going to be a robust, expensive opposition campaign to anything that gets put on the ballot, but voters may be like, why would I vote for something that makes it harder for me to change policy? So what is your thought process about any of these ideas actually finding favor with Missouri voters? I think anytime you can deliver the message that you are also limiting the legislature and their ability to change what was passed, that people will be receptive to that. There has been some discussion that any measure increasing the constitutional amendment threshold could be placed on the August ballot, and then if it's passed, it would then take, I don't know, 57, 60 percent to pass a constitutional amendment around abortion. And Speaker Dean Plocker openly advocated for this strategy at the end of session. Do you think that that would be a good idea? I think placing it on the August ballot, if it's ready to go, would be a great idea uh, because we want to make sure that we are getting people voting on it before any other measures are out there. And this is an idea that has been out there long before any thought of abortion uh, initiative petitions were proposed. Which is absolutely true. I just want to make clear that I have been writing about this in 2014. (laughs) So I I think that is actually accurate. Before we go into 2024 session, because you do have one more year, and I do have questions about that. Why do you think that you would make a better Republican nominee for Secretary of State than the other people who are running for this post on the GOP side? Well, I think in my time in Jefferson City, uh, the three sessions that I've worked, I've gained uh, respect from not everyone, not just everyone on my side of the aisle, but also on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I know one candidate's talking about being able to work with uh, the other party. So there's that aspect of it. Uh, There's also the aspect of me coming from a 50-50 purple district. And I told the people how I plan on voting, that I am a strong conservative, And you take a look at my ACU, the American Conservative Union score card from 2022. I was in the 90s. Um, uh, Other people from 50-50 districts, they aren't scoring near as high. So I've got my conservative bona fides. Um, I work with the other side of the aisle. And I am receptive to ideas and in changing my legislation. If you take a look at the legislation that I've been able to pass... Uh, It's mostly been through the amendment process. However, it has changed from filing to passing. And because I am sitting there, I am receptive to listening to both sides, to seeing uh, what public policy, how it's going to affect, what changes need to be made. So I feel that in just my short time there that I can demonstrate why exactly I would be the best candidate for Secretary of State. And just for our listeners, we are planning to have 
the other three Republicans on who are running for this office eventually. We have until August of 2024, so we have some time, but you get to be the first one. So I greatly appreciate it. So what are going to be some things that you're going to be expecting to be top of mind when the legislature returns in 2024? And what are going to be some things that you're going to be working on? Uh, so as a representative for 9.7 square miles in St. Charles, the very first bill that I filed was a bill dealing with waste transfer stations. I've still got that legislation out there. In fact, I almost had that legislation passed last year. I purposely had it pulled because there was a business in Jackson County that would have been harmed by this. And so that's exactly what I'm talking about is I could have had it done. I could have gone back to my district and said, we got it finished. However, it would have harmed a business in Missouri. So I said, let's go back, work on it some more. I've got that new updated language, and I'm ready to get that passed this next year. How do you think the dynamics of the legislature will change since it's an election year and people like you are running for other offices? I think it will certainly affect uh, what bills are moving through, uh, who the sponsors are. Uh, sadly, that is the nature of uh, our state, of our politics, but I'm still planning on pushing through good legislation that benefits people. Uh, just a meeting I had this morning was over the Nonprofit Safety and Security Task Force and supplemental funding. Uh, we see synagogues, uh, me being Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, we see how much m extra money we have to spend on security, on hardening the synagogues and our schools. And so I have a bill that will help ensure that the funding is there and available for these places. How would that work exactly? I'm also Jewish, and I do remember when I went to Temple as a youngster, there was security around synagogues. But my, my impression was that was often paid for by the synagogue and not by the state. Like, how would it work from a functional level? So on the federal level, there is the nonprofit safety and security grants that these uh, organizations are applying for and getting. However, it's not enough when you go all the way around. There are still the cost, even if you are uh, approved, there are so many extra costs associated with that security. And so this would just create a fund here in Missouri, and several other states have done this already, uh, that these uh, organizations that have applied for this funding, they essentially could be approved now on the state level, and it's a supplemental fund. And would it be just for synagogues, or would there be no religious litmus test? So could it be for churches or mosques or uh, you know Buddhist temples as well? Yeah, it's a nonprofit uh, organization that is applying for these grants based upon the Department of Homeland Security's uh, requirements to apply for them. So it seems like it would be any religious yes. institution and not just a specific one. Yeah, any, any place that has had a threat. I do want to ask, we're in kind of an odd situation where the House Speaker, Dean Plocker, is going to be running for statewide office. This is the first time this has happened in a long time. Like, Steve Tilley was going to run for lieutenant governor, but he kind of abandoned that campaign before the 2012 session. So the last time there has been a speaker running for statewide office, from my recollection, is Catherine Hannaway in 2004. Do you think that that could negatively impact the legislative process in any way? Because maybe people that don't like Dean Plocker in the Senate aren't going to listen to him as much because they don't want to see him be successful. I think people are going to be people, and it will affect uh, negatively, unfortunately, this next legislative session. You have um, myself running for Secretary of State. You have Budget Chair Cody Smith running for Treasurer, and you have Speaker Plocker running for Lieutenant Governor. Well, we all have counterparts in the Senate running for those same offices, so there definitely will be uh, some friction I foresee happening this next year. Now, even if the House is as well-functioning as possible— uh, it may still screech to a halt, and by it I mean the legislative session, if there's still chaos in the Missouri Senate. What's kind of your – you can't control the Senate. I, I know you want to, or maybe you don't want to. I I'm not know. running for lieutenant it, governor. Yeah, so. You're not running for lieutenant governor. Is there any hope that the Senate factionalism will be lessened this year, or, or is it going to be even worse since it's an election year and there will be even less done? Uh, from the legislature because of that. If I had a crystal ball that could tell me what was happening, I would probably use it to try and win uh, Mega Millions or Powerball. Uh, but uh, 
my confidence level is not very high. It is not very high amongst a lot of people. I, I'm, I'm going to just go through a litany of issues. Okay. We had Representative Mike Hafner on recently talking about uh, legislation that curtails some foreign-owned businesses from buying land. As he pointed out, it's not just farmland, it's any land. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what do you kind of think of that, that idea? Because I understand, like, the reasoning behind it. Like, we don't want China, North Korea, Iran buying a bunch of land. Um, but I think from a property, there there may be, like, property rights questions, too, that, like, should you just restrict somebody from being able to conduct business in Missouri because they're a company based with a certain nationality? I'd be interested in your opinion on this, given that there is some cross pollination between this issue and and what the Secretary of State does with businesses. Yeah, I think we have to be very careful when treading in these waters. I know uh, one of the candidates in the Secretary of State's uh, race, he voted for the legislation that allowed the opening of the sale. Uh, and now he's calling for it to be closed. So uh, trying to solve a problem that he helped create in his eyes. But there is also, you mentioned the uh, liberties of the businesses and organizations and the foreign nationals on purchasing land. What about my rights to sell to them? Uh, so it is a very delicate issue that we do need to be very careful on when crafting this policy. And when we're talking about agricultural land, which seems to be kind of the flashpoint from what you talked about, I mean, we're talking about Smithfield here. Smithfield is a Hong Kong-based company, and in the 2010s, there was a bill that basically allowed them to continue to exist in Missouri. Um, And I just question, like, any bill that would be passed on this issue, would you be able to, like, as a state, tell Smithfield you have to sell your land after this happens and what if they say no like and and what sort of impact would that have on the missouri economy i know these are more observations than questions Mm -hmm. but what do you think about some of these these issues of like forcing a company like smithfield to to give up their land and whether that's even possible or not yeah i know it it's things that we have to be very aware of when crafting policy and uh, making legislation is the unintended consequences. What about uh, foreign businesses that do want to invest in Missouri? Uh, I couldn't even tell you how many nations have business owners here in the St. Louis area that instead of renting, perhaps they want to buy their, their land, or perhaps they are doing research on agriculture. I mean, you take a look at Monsanto being bought by Bayer. Uh, Granted, that's probably not the best example for a lot of people, but... Well, I think it's probably because people don't see a German-owned company as a threat, whereas I think anytime you see a company that's owned by China, there's a lot of questions about the government of China's role in that company. But I also think, like, at certain points, if you're an entity like Smithfield, which has a pretty established footprint even before they were bought by a a Hong Kong-based company... That you're you're dealing in you're dealing with some very gray area there to put it mildly, but, mm-hmm. but continue. Yeah, there's lots of uh, lots of landmines that you could step on with that. So I just caution my colleagues when crafting this legislation to make sure that we are looking not just at crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but also dotting the lowercase J's. And one of the other things that didn't end up passing that Governor Parson has emphasized in his state of the state speech and uh, is some sort of like incentives to help child care centers. Um, I think there was a proposal to do some tax credits on that front. Again, I do think that this does kind of dovetail with Secretary of State's office because child care centers are almost always private businesses that often have a lot of issues with dealing with the state. How would you like to navigate that issue where you are supporting child care centers from a state perspective, but while also making them easier to, like, be set up and operate, which I know is kind of like a tricky issue uh, compared to, say, like opening up a bakery or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got uh, two beautiful daughters, Emma and Ella. Uh, Emma actually just had her 11th birthday uh, yesterday, as of this recording, I should say. so I recently navigated the cost of child care. And to think how much it's skyrocketed since then, it just it boggles my mind. And when you're dealing with small businesses, uh, we need to ensure that they are successful. Because over half of all private sector jobs in this state are from small business. 
And so the tools that we need in order to be successful are ensuring that the people who are starting these businesses that need a little bit of help, uh, especially in pulling their resources for child care, is being taken care of. Well, Representative, thank you so much for joining us on Politically Speaking. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis, which I believe you're an alum of, by the I way, am, correct? Yeah. Um, how can people find out more about your campaign or what you're doing in the legislature? Uh, you can find me on my website, adamschwadron.com. I'm also on Twitter or X, at AJ Schwadron. And also uh, my Facebook page right now is still set up as State Representative Adam Schwadron. Thank you very much, and until next time, so long.